everyone this is dr russ jones and brad kennan we are wide open tonight how are you fine how are you doing i am doing good i'm uh i'm excited the weather was warm it was about 90 in charleston i was able to be out i was in the woods some i was hiking around doing all that stuff and uh i got a question for you yeah go ahead all right. So back in the day, of course, you know, I used to run a lot of races and mm -hmm. I used to cycle, you know, centuries, which is for the people who don't do it, it's a hundred mile thing. And, you know, I would get up in the morning before daylight and I would ride a hundred miles and then uh, spend the night someplace and ride a hundred miles back. And then I realized that I was, I needed to get a life of some type and you couldn't do that if you were doing that by yourself. And so I started doing some, um, marathons. I did a couple of those. And of course, that's all ancient history. But have you ever no done no? Wow, that was quick. Have I'm, you ever I'm, watched any of those on TV? Yes, I've watched uh, triathlons. Uh, I have watched those. Okay, um, I've never participated. I've never had the desire to participate. I don't know why. I would go play basketball for three hours, three times a week. But you know, I'm you didn't not, feel the need to make your body uh, suffer. No. I remember one time I was uh, I was training. I was doing, getting ready to do the Marine Corps Marathon, and you know you had the certain schedule you're on. And so, um, you know, I was single, and there was these ladies that asked me to go to this college football game, and I was like, no, I had to do that. You had to have so many miles in that day or whatever, so I couldn't do it. And I got like three miles out from the house, and I pulled a muscle in my leg, and I had to walk back home, and I'm limping, and I'm thinking, you know, you have to get a life. I mean, this is ridiculous. You, you know, you just can't keep doing this. But for whatever reason, you know, I've always, uh, you know, it's a good stress reliever. It's a good way to push your body. I've enjoyed, you know, like even with fasting and that type of thing, I like feeling my body uncomfortable. Have you been doing any of that? I do my fasting, which honestly, if you do it a couple of weeks, it, uh, you just get so used to it. You're not even uncomfortable after, you know, 16 hours or 17 hours or whatever that is. So you uh, stop eating like after dinner at eight by yeah, eight or something. Mm -hmm. And then you go to lunch or whatever. It happens yeah. I'll, to I'll, I'll drink maybe some unsweet tea, you know, we'll brew some unsweet tea in the morning and just have some regular old iced tea until noon. And that's about it. Yeah. The mm -hmm. patients, a lot of times they're wanting to do it, but you know, there, cause a lot of the anti-aging doctors, you know, are doing the intermittent fasting and there's a lot of research behind it but the patients want to eat whatever they want during that eight hour window. And a lot of times, you know, you just, you just can't do that. You still have to no. eat reasonably. Right. Yeah. I, I, it's funny. I hear people talk about, well, I can just for eight hours, I can do whatever I want. I tried that like twice and it just makes me feel awful. Yeah. You just so can't do it, that. Yeah. No, no, no. So you got to still be like, I, said, I agree with you. You have to be not uncomfortable, but it's, I feel much better when I don't eat a ton. You know, I always you know, tell the patients steak or chicken or something. Just, you know, you've had enough cheat days. You've had enough <laughs> cheat meals. I mean, everybody all the time. Well, you know, you have to let yourself have some stuff. No, but you don't. No, you yeah, don't. that's exactly right. I think when you get to a weight that or a fitness level that you're com comfortable with, then if you want to have, you know, Saturdays, a lot of times I'll do whatever it is that I want to do. But the rest of the week, you know, I'm very strict and I need to get my workouts in. But, right. you know, I don't think that, gosh, I mean, I wonder how long you could compete in those endurance races those you know extreme adventure races i mean i mean i'm sure there's some people doing it you know probably what 20s and 30s maybe into early 40s you're in a prime but gosh it'd be hard to maintain that and have a life well how old's uh what david coggins he's i yeah. don't know how old he is man that dude's a, just an, an animal so yeah but there are people that are just i think they're wired a little bit different yeah um but you know who we can ask tell me do share we can ask our guest this evening, uh, Jenny Davis. We're going to bring her on the show. Hey, Jenny. She, she is an extreme athlete, something that I've never done. Um, she is a, uh, she has run marathons across the what Sahara Desert, I do believe. She has yes. run marathons. Mm -hmm. Deserts were her thing at one time. Then she decided, well, I've conquered the desert. I'm going to run across the cold. So she ran, you know, 100 miles across, or I think it was 124 miles or something. Was it something similar that'll cross Sweden in like 30 below zero weather? Um, if I'm misspeaking, go ahead and correct me at any time. Um, no, the reason I'm pausing is that um, my brain actually does Celsius, whereas you guys do Fahrenheit. And then for races, <laughs> I do kilometers and you do miles. So I'm like, uh, are those correct? <laughs> and so it's, it was a long way. Let's, we'll just say yeah, it's a long yeah. way. <laughs> and then after all that, she said, you know what? I really haven't done enough. 
I think I'm going to go to the South Pole. Yeah. So she, she trekked to the South Pole, and the world is flat. She confirmed with me, <laughs> walked in, and she te- she te- hit the glass in the big yeah. dome we're in, and she turned around and came back. But that's a joke, so I'm don't even you know. You're gonna get me in trouble if you say that. Oh, it's like people He's gonna get us in trouble. <laughs> the flat earthers AI is gonna pick up this podcast. And next thing you know, we're gonna be yeah. snippets on Instagram. <laughs> anyway, Jenny, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, you have a accent that is not from Southern Ohio. Uh, where nope. are you from originally? <laughs> um, I'm from Scotland. Okay, um, awesome. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So we are currently living in Columbus, um, Ohio, just for one year. Um, my husband's a surgeon in the military, and he has taken a fellowship position at OSU. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, the whole family's here just for 12 months. Yeah. Why so, is it that we, we get the boring accents? You know what I mean? Like, everybody well, we, in the world. Yeah. <laughs> I think the grass is always greener. Like, in the UK, if you were in the UK right now, people would be like, oh, my goodness, I absolutely love your accent. All right. Um, which, I get, which I get here a lot, yeah. <laughs> so, my question, first of all, how long have you been here in the U.S.? We have been here since um, October, so just a couple months. Yeah. Okay, so you mm-hmm. did catch some of the OSU football season. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we okay. uh, The weekend we arrived was the OSU-Michigan game. Uh, oh, that went really badly. Yeah, yeah. We, don't say, we don't say the M word around here. <laughs> I'm learning that. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> and then we got that. really into the, the Bengals for the NFL. That was, oh, that was yeah, real I've been, fun. I've yeah. been a huge Bengals fan for a long time, and thank goodness <laughs> they're winning something. So anyway, enough about that. You're over here for a year. Mm-hmm. Um, you are this extreme athlete that you have, like I said, you've run across deserts, the Sahara. I think it was deemed the uh, the hardest race in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Marathon de Saab. Yeah. And that was, how long was that? That's 260 kilometers. Yeah, it was a five-day race, um, and you have to carry everything you need on your back. Okay, so you don't have like you know the, like the Tour de France has like a, a car falling with like ten bicycles in case a yeah, bicycle no. breaks a jump on one. You None just <laughs> you're literally by yourself or with a partner. You're running with a partner of some sort, and you just have your what? I mean, ten? How many five days will have water with you? So water you can collect as you go, and um, they don't expect you to carry that. Okay, uh, but right, every, everything okay. else is on your back. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. So you did that. And how long ago did you do that? Oh my goodness. That's a good question. I want to say six years ago, maybe a bit longer. Oh, than really? That. So yeah. Six, fa- seven years ago. Mm-hmm. So fair. That's fairly recent in my book. Mm, um, it is. So after that, you said, I've, ah, the heat's no big deal. I'm going to do the cold. So you went up and, and you raced across Sweden. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. And you decided, well, this isn't so bad. I yeah. Go. I, t- I think I'm going to the South Pole. So tell us how that happened. Yeah, I'm not sure I absolutely know myself. It does sound like quite a jump. But as you say, like my, I was very much known for running across deserts. So in the Gobi Desert in China, um, all over Europe, and then suddenly parts of Africa. Um, a friend of mine was finally interested in doing a race with me. Um, and I'm sure you might know this, Russ. It's hard to get people to want to do these things with you. They're like, no, yes. no, no, I'm not going to do a century on the bike. I know you. We're not doing that. Yeah. And my best friend was like, I think I want to do one. And I was like, oh, my goodness, name your race. I'm, I'll do any race with you. She's like, I think I like the sign of this one in Sweden. And um, I was like, oh, I don't think I'm – I didn't think I was that great in the cold. I used to get um, really bad pain in my fingertips. Um, so I wasn't totally keen on it. Did it anyway. I actually thought, I'm, I'm not bad at this. I did fall through a frozen lake. Um, I got a bit of frost nip on the back of a heel, um, but I, I still did really well in the race. And after that, I was like, I know what I'm doing in the cold. I think, like, what is this going to open up? I'm going to look at some other things. Um, I had the time of my life because I did that race with my best friend. I remember at one point running across a frozen lake in the middle of the night, and I heard these, like, footsteps, and I turned around, and there was a moose um, with its calf running alongside me. And then that, at that That's exact cool. moment, the northern light started up above us. Dang. Um, and that, those are the reasons that I do these things. I mean, moments like that, you, you so, can, can buy it, you know? So well, Brad long... would just drive there. He would say, well, I can drive there and then get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, like, so, I like to see countries by running through them, across them, everything. So um, Russ interrupted me. Um, I <laughs> lost my train of thought. Um, so how long did that race take? That was another, that was a six day race. Yeah. Okay, so so mm-hmm. six days and it's very cold across Sweden. Yeah. Um, 
do you stop and sleep or do you just kind of keep moving the whole time? Um, what, so what you, it depends on the format work? of the race. Yeah, this okay. one, their their actual tent stops in the evening okay. where everyone has to stop after a set distance. Okay. Um, part of that's for safety, uh, warm up, get some hot food in you, and then go again at the same time. Everyone leaves the same time the next morning. Okay. Um, right. The alternative format to that is you do it in one go. So I did a like a 300 mile race across the Gobi Desert, and that was everyone just goes. Um, that's actually a bit more dangerous because then you're, you know, no one wants to stop running. So I think at one point I ran for like 44 hours and hadn't yet taken a break. That's crazy. Yeah, it is. It's not because these, you know, you can imagine the mindset of these kind of people. No one's stopping until the first person stops and then everyone might have a break. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I was going to say, is that something, you know, I think that's a psychological switch that maybe some people have that, mm -hmm. you know, you're so competitive, which I, you know, I played some sports growing up and, you know, my kids were in sports and things like that. And I would just have to walk away because I would be so nervous the night before I play intramural basketball game. I couldn't sleep because I want to win so bad. Yeah. And I can imagine, you know, you guys take it to kind of this extreme to run 44 hours and not yeah. really. I know it, it sounds like a lot. I don't, I don't know where that it is definitely a switch that goes off. It's like, mm -hmm the tunnel vision comes down and you're here for a reason, you train for this and away you go. Um, but for me, I absolutely love the test of the mental resilience. I love being able to see if I can do what I've set out to do. And there's been plenty of failures. You don't, you don't always finish them. You don't always make it past day one. That doesn't matter. Um, it's the people you do it with. It's the people that meet, it's the countries that you go to. But I, I, I love that. Like when you say I'm competitive, it's very much competitive with myself. Um, I don't really care too much about what other people are doing unless they're ahead of me, in which case I've I got to get in front of them. <laughs> now, now, how long did you prepare for like a race like that? How long do you prepare for that race? Um, it really depends. When I first started, the first one I ever did, I really didn't have much time to get ready at all. Um, I was in hospital. I'd find out that I had a, a tumor in my stomach. Um, and... They didn't know what it was, how it was going to be. Turns out everything, I, mean, I was fine in the end. But when I was in hospital recovering from the surgery, um, I took an iPad and that's when I signed up to the Marathon de Sable, that, that desert oh, race wow. you talked about. I don't actually remember doing it. Um, I was completely high on morphine. But I think what <laughs> I was doing is like, a, I know I'm going to be okay. And once I get out of here, I need something to kind of focus on. I forgot I signed up and about three months later, I get an email saying, congratulations, you're off the waiting list for the Marathon de Sable. You have a spot. You just have to pay the deposit. And I remember sitting there, I was having like a Sunday lunch with my family and I was so confused. And then I suddenly was like, wait a minute, I, I kind of remember something about signing up for this. Um, and I was like, screw it, I'm, this, I'm meant to do this. So that one was very kind of short, uh, short preparation. But um, you learn so much each time you do one of these races. But the usual preparation for something like this is really just bulletproofing the body because it's so repetitive on the body. You know, so if you haven't strengthened every kind of part of the chain that's doing the running, used to running with a heavy backpack with everything you need, something's going to break down. And actually, it does kind of break down eventually. It's the whole thing's like a war of attrition, right? But you're doing everything to bulletproof the body so you last as long as possible because it's the same repetitive motion of running yes. or skiing, whatever it is. Um, but I, I love the preparation. The preparation is so much fun for me. It's the physical training. Like I love having a, a plan that I set out with a coach. And I will not miss that plan. Nothing comes in the way of me and that training session. Um, it might be in the evening rather than the morning or lunchtime or whatever, but it gets done. I love that element of it. And then uh, the other side I love is like the the geekiness around getting like the lightest possible dehydrated meal that you're going to carry in your back and doing all the planning for your calorie intake and what you're going to carry and where you're going to get your water from. And absolutely love that stuff. <laughs> well, if I got high on morphine in the hospital, I would not sign up for a 254 kilometer race. <laughs> yeah. I would probably buy a new pair of shoes, maybe a new pair of boots. Um, and they would show up and I'd be like, Oh, I don't remember buying these new pair of shoes, but um, that is the difference between you and I, I guess. So you did the, the Sahara race there. Mm -hmm. Then you did the Swedish race. And then we're going to get to why you're on the air. You decided you're going to go to Antarctica or did somebody decide for you? No, that's definitely something you decide okay. for yourself. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm just making sure like somebody didn't suggest it says, hey, you know, uh, we're going to sponsor you, but you really have to go to Antarctica. 
No, so anyway, just, tell yeah. tell us all this. You this this is fascinating to me because this is like there's nothing there. I mean, this is no, yeah. I could vouch for that. There's truly there's pyramids there. there. Right. Are pyramids there <laughs> and <laughs> right. a glass wall at the end, like right? <laughs> so we don't fall off the side of the earth. Anyway, go um, ahead. I'd always wanted to go to Antarctica. I didn't know how or when, and um, I did know a lot about polar explorers. I grew up kind of reading about Ernest Shackleton, um, who's a huge hero of mine, and I just literally decided one day. I had a dream the night before that I was going to Antarctica. In that dream, I woke up at breakfast. I said to my now husband. I'm going to, next thing I'm doing is going to be in Antarctica and um, I'm going to, I'm going to ski to the South Pole, but I'm doing it solo um, and I'm not sure how it's going to look like, how I'm going to do it, how I'm going to get there. Cause it is a huge amount of money to put together to go and do an expedition like that. You also need, um, it's the same in the U S as the UK. You need permission from government to go there. And you also have to demonstrate to government uh, that you are capable of, of keeping safe in that environment because they don't want idiot tourists like me <laughs> arriving right. in Antarctica and not knowing what they're doing and they fall down right. a crevasse and you have a huge military rescue. It's just a total nightmare. So there's a lot you have to prove. You have to show that you have the experience. So things like the race in Sweden helped me. I had to do a lot of training expeditions. I went to Colorado. I went all over the place. Um, went to Norway for some rope work and just being able to demonstrate that you could get yourself out of a, a crevasse if you had to. Um, and yeah, I told my family, uh, I think that on Christmas Eve, the night before Christmas, I was like, guys, I've got something to tell you. I'm going to go and do this. And honest to God, no one even batted an eyelid. Um, it was very much like, okay, Jenny, yeah, sure you are. And then there's the process of finding the money for it. So that was a huge job in itself. And I'm still at that point working full time as an attorney. And, um, I needed about, I think all in, it was like $200,000, oh probably God. around there. Oh my. Yeah. And then my plan was I'd studied the the gentleman who still holds the men's speed record um, for skiing. So the world record is skiing solo from the coastline of Antarctica, Hercules Inlet to the South Pole. It's about, call it 750 miles, something like that. And um, I wanted to break the woman's record. And the, the guy who has a men's record, uh, he actually um, arrived in Antarctica early um, to prepare, get acclimated to the cold, to the to the altitude. And he climbed Mount Vincent first. Mount Vincent's one of the seven summits. Uh, I'm a big mountaineer and I, I definitely wanted to climb Mount Vincent. I was like, if I'm coming to Antarctica, it's going to be once in my lifetime. So whilst I'm there, i got to climb this mountain. Um, my now husband had just proposed, so we decided we were both going to go to Antarctica. We were both going to climb Mount Vincent as our honeymoon. That's cool. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. A very expensive, but a lot of fun. Um, that would help me acclimatize. We'd have a great time together. And then he was going to fly back to London, and I was going to fly uh, to the start line for the world record attempt, and away I go. Um, it was incredible. I remember the plane, with just there's just me in the plane and two pilots. They drop me off on the coastline. There is nothing there. There's no marker. There's no like this way. <laughs> Just off you Dang. go. It's you. Yeah, exactly. Um, the only emergency equipment I have on me is a satellite phone. I have to call back to base, which is several hundred miles away, um, every evening at the same time, give my location, how I'm doing, etc. But but that that's it. I have a huge sled. Um, anyone wants to see what it looks like. There's pictures on my Instagram of the sled and the setup and thing. Just so it helps give a visual. And I remember the plane landed, tiny little jet. I get out and the pilot's like, well, I guess this is goodbye. And um, it was a beautiful day because it can only land when the weather is nice. And off they went. And I remember just standing there thinking, this is the moment where I either burst into tears or I just burst out laughing. Like at the complete ridiculousness of what I have pulled off in less than a year. And, and here I am, I'm about to ski. It's gonna take me around 35 to 38 days by myself. Um, and you can imagine what the weather's like there. I just burst out laughing. I literally have never laughed so hard in my life. And um, yeah, off I went. Like that's when the clock starts. So the, the world record is officially starting. I've got a tracker on me that people can follow online, all that kind of thing. Um, the weather is the worst they've had on record in something like 40 years, I find out afterwards. And there was a lot of snow. Believe it or not, there's not actually that much snow in Antarctica. It's just kind of ice cap. But there's a huge amount of snow. I'm sinking all the time. It's not easy. It was really, really hard. Complete whiteout. So it's like, I describe it as like skiing in a marshmallow. Like you just cannot see anything. I couldn't see my own hand. 
And when that happens, you don't, you lose like a sense of what's up or down, left or right. It's really disorientating and it, it was making me feel really unwell. And I remember one day um, I just vomited into my mask. So all your skin obviously has to be covered because it's so cold. And the vomit immediately froze um, in the airway. And I remember like having to like peel out the bits of froze, chunk and frozen vomit and just being in tears. And it was like some of the days were just so rough. But keep on going, keep on going. Like you fought so hard to be here. And also so many people have funded you to be here. The companies that have sponsored, et cetera. Like you got to keep going. You're not stopping. Um, and then I think it was like day 20, day 21, I was not on track for the record. Like the weather was just not giving me a break. Skiing from like 6 a.m. till 7, 8 p.m. Just trying to do anything to get those miles in. And um, I started getting really bad stomach pain. And I knew deep, deep down that it was something a bit different. I knew it wasn't just like, I mean, I've all the things I've done, I know how to put pain in one, one place in my mind and then just push through. But this was something I was really struggling to push through. It's a bit of a red, red, red flag. Right. Um, I did eventually tell the doctor on the phone uh, using that satellite phone I mentioned. And they got pretty nervous pretty quickly because there was a polar explorer the year before me, a, a, a very, very experienced um, British soldier. And he... Um, passed away from peritonitis, like a, a bowel leak that then becomes infected. He got septicemia and he, and he died. Um, so they were very, very on edge about me reporting very similar symptoms. But I also didn't want to be pulled. I did not want anyone to come and do a medical evacuation. You can understand why all that time, the preparation, the physical training to get there. Like yes. You could do a whole podcast on just the physical preparation to get ready for something like that. And pulling that sled, everything. I didn't, I didn't want to go anywhere. I didn't want them to know that I was sick. Um, but then there was one day I stopped moving completely and they figured out that I hadn't moved. And so all, all the other recordings, uh, all the conversations are actually recorded. And afterwards, um, someone told me who listened to the conversation that between me and the doctor was the most, most polite, passive aggressive discussion they'd ever listened to. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I do not need to be medically evacuated. Um, and I'm pretty stubborn um, when I want to be. And so there was no way they were pulling me out of there. But when I didn't move that day, I couldn't really argue with it any longer. Um, and yeah, they actually sent out a medical flight without really telling me. Um, and this plane just lands beside me. He's like, we've got to go. There's a doctor on board. Um, and that was that. I go back to back to the UK. And... So, I, so I have a question. Mm. So you're 20 some days in. So, you, yeah. you know, do you stop every night and sleep for four or five hours, three hours? Or you have a tent, sleeping bag? Absolutely. Just... All okay. of that. So yeah. you have all when that you're... stuff. When you're putting, sorry, I should have given a bit more context. Yeah. When you're putting that tent up, like you're, you're done. You've got it up in less than two minutes. It's so okay. cold, if the, especially if the winds are up, you are in that tent immediately. And you have a stove, you're boiling water from, from chunks of ice, chunks of snow. And then you have like 50 days worth of food, 40 days worth of whatever you bring um, of dehydrated meals. Um, so each bag would be labeled for that day, like day 21. And we've each got like 5,000 calories around about that in there. Okay. Um, I, I never, ever stopped. Um, I rarely took breaks. I like to just carry on. I mean, just like fill my mouth with the food I needed to eat and keep skiing. Uh, but overnight, yeah, you're in that tent. Um, yeah. And, and what, you know, most people never see Antarctica. I mean, this is the South pole. This is the South part of the, the earth. And I think that's where penguins are. Correct. Penguins are not in yes. the North or in the South. Mm -hmm. So is this, you know, is it a flat desert? Is it got hills, ups and down, rises, chunks of ice everywhere, crevasses? You have to worry about birds, that. animals. You know, what do you what do you see yeah. out here? And um, so definitely some kind of hills, but they're very hard to make out a lot of the time because it's just so vast and everything's kind of the same color. So there's nothing um, breaking the wind. No, there's nothing breaking the wind. Okay. No. All right. No. Okay. There are, I mean, the the major crevasses, I'm kind of navigating away from them on purpose. Okay. Um, but there's definitely sometimes you get real close to them and you can see them from afar. But it's very hard to explain. It's very hard to get depth perception because you've got nothing to focus on from afar and kind of get an idea that, okay, that's over there. Um but it's also so incredibly beautiful. I've had a lot of people say to me, oh gosh, it sounds like there's nothing to look at. I don't remember once being bored. As much as it might sound like you get bored, like on the on the, the hard weather days when you can't see anything um, and it's cold and it's windy, you are just focusing on getting through that day one step at a time. Then on the days when it's like glorious blue sky and the sun is just like rotating above you over the course of the day, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. Um, and the one Howard thing I did... 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was was curious about how you were navigating. Uh, The compass. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Old old school. Yeah. Um, The people use it in cross country skiing races. Um, It's like a compass mic that you have on your chest. So the compass is literally right in front of you. You don't have to hold it all the time. Um, And just doing that. I did also have like a GPS backup. Um, but throughout the day, it's just looking at that compass, um, which I, I really loved about it because it's all, it's all on you. That's the, that's the thing about these solo expeditions that I, I really love. I love doing team things, but solo things is where you kind of, you really learn what you're made of because there's no one to rely on but you. Um, you have to know everything. You have to know how to fix a rip in the tent. You need to know how to repair a tent bowl in the wind. How does your stove work? Which bit on it is broken? How are you going to mend it? Like there's no splitting up jobs amongst the team it is everything is on you the navigation and it's it's also it's a more it's a more dangerous expedition because um especially if you someone with this kind of mindset because i would keep skiing all night but if i was with doing it with you guys i'd be more of a team mentality and be like well how's russ doing does he need a break shall we do this shall we do that so there's all these things you really need to learn about yourself and i had to make up rules before i went like i will not ski past nine o'clock no matter what um, because I know I need that break. I will always make sure I eat no matter what. Um, so it's a fascinating way to learn a huge amount about yourself and your character. So I would be concerned. Well, I, there's a lot of concerns I would have. If it was me, but, <laughs> you know, one thing would be, you know, you're exerting all this energy. Your, your clothes are sweating. You have, I'm sure, some sort of base layer on or something of that sort, I would assume. Mm-hmm. Um, that gets wet. You stop. You get yeah. cold you start again, you know, it never, we had a gentleman on here. I, there's something about people from this Island of the UK and Scotland that are, uh, we've had on our show, you know, the other guy, what he, it took him, what, 39 days to row across the Atlantic ocean. Yes. So he rode across the Atlantic ocean, him and three guys in a rowboat. Um, you know, he said they literally rode for two days or for two hours, tried to rest for two hours, two other people took over, blah, blah. So he said, literally from the time we started to the time we got done, I was wet. He said, yeah. I never dried out. He said, you know, yeah. the sleeping bag was wet. The clothes were wet. There was just mist in the air. And I can imagine that you kind of felt that same way. Is that, you know, just that wet, yeah. that constant, you could just never get right. So no, um, okay. simply because if you if you got if you were sweating in Antarctica, yeah. you haven't you haven't done your homework. You probably okay. shouldn't be there because you okay. will die. Yeah, okay. you will freeze and you'll get really sick really quickly. That's how you get hypothermia. Um, no, you do not freeze. The, the golden rule of like being in these cold conditions is you, if you, especially if you're skiing, so it's quite vigorous exercise. You mm-hmm. start cold. You should not be stepping outside ready to ski, fully covered up in all your all your big um, okay your big duffel jackets. You want to start cold. Okay. Um, no, I, I did not sweat. If, if you're sweating, you're doing it wrong. Except okay. on the, actually, believe it or not, some days when the, it's blue skies, it's actually really hot. I was just down to a base layer skiing. Oh, okay. Um, I actually got sunburned a couple of times. <laughs> That's crazy. That's hard to imagine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. And the, the first time, the first time I attempted to go to the pole, I actually came home with a vitamin D deficiency because um, you're exerting your body so much, but also my entire body was covered up. There wasn't one nice day of weather. So everything has to be covered. So I wasn't getting any kind of sunshine. Um, okay, yeah, so, I, went, I went home. So that was after 21 days. They met evac you out. Yeah. Uh, okay, start from there again. I was very sorry. happy. Yeah, it was it was tough. Um, before I left to that expedition, there was a lot of press coverage, a lot of press attention. And I honestly thought I had it in the back. I thought I was going to nail the whole thing beginning to end. So I was kind of humbling. Um, I did not enjoy the feeling of failure at all. I actually remember I sent my dad a text message that said, I dad, I, d- I don't think I want to be who I am because um, I don't like this feeling of failing at something. And I'd failed at plenty of things, uh, races before, but not in this big way that it was all over the news. You know what I mean? And I, I was like, I'm not made out for this. I don't like how this feels. Um, and that lasted about two or three days. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I get over these things pretty quickly, but I decided, look, I want to go back, number one. That was tricky for several reasons. I didn't know if the sponsors were going to have my back again because I've just cost you a lot of money. We went to Antarctica. I didn't do what I was hoping to do. And they they understood that, but you just don't know how it's going to go down. But also work was the next problem. Um, So my my work at the time, the board was so encouraging of me going to Antarctica. They loved it. It was great for their business. It looked great to people who came across them. Like, this is Jenny. She's our lawyer. She's doing this. 
So but, were you were you in like a decent sized law firm at that point in time or you know, Yeah, at that time or? I was I was in house legal. Okay. Um, so I was head of legal for a renewable energy company. So for me to okay. disappear for like six to eight weeks is kind of a big deal. And they had to hire in um two people to cover me while I'm away. Okay. So very supportive for the first time. Okay. I don't know how it's gonna go down a second time. <laughs> okay. Especially as I, I told the board I I'm not, you know, next time I go away and do expeditions, it's just gonna be unusual vacation time. I'm not gonna ask for a big chunk of time again, promise. <laughs> um anyway, I, I knew I was gonna go back. I kept it quiet for the longest time and I made the decision that I wasn't going down the route of getting any being depressed, nothing like that. I'm just gonna go and do it. Um I had to go back and do it again because I do not feel like I'd given it my best shot. Um, I learned a lot. And so I decided you can only go to Antarctica to do this kind of thing in their summer season, which runs from November to end of January. So I got back from the first attempt um, in January. I had to go to hospital for a couple of nights with the, the bowel infection, but I recovered really quickly. Um, and I went back that year, that November, okay. uh, which people thought was pretty damn fast. But um, I was absolutely determined. And my main sponsor at the time, um, an American sponsor uh, called Atkins, so they do like protein bars and yeah, things yeah. like that. Yep. They were so supportive. They immediately were like, we've been waiting for you to call and say, you're going back. Like we assumed you would be, we've, we've totally got you, here's the check. Um, so that was great. And um, yeah, went back again. Very different attitude this time. The, the, the work I did throughout the year was to not, think that if I didn't get the world record, it would be a failure. That was the mistake from the first time. Absolutely. Like these, there's so many variables in this. And you think I would know that I've done before, but there's so many things. And actually I realized that's what draws me to them. You never know how this is going to end. And sometimes it's nothing to do with how well you prepared. It's just the weather or it's, or it's whatever. Right. Um, and that's why I love these things. So I had to say that, look, you've got to, you got to give up that the, the only uh, success here is if you come home with a new world record. I definitely wanted it. And, um, but I very much focused on the goal here is to reach the South Pole in one piece. Um, yeah, so I went back and, um, it was just flying. I was ahead of the world record by two and a half days at one point, having oh, wow. the time of my life. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was just incredible. Everything was just working as planned. Um, honestly, like nothing but joy. Um, and I can't, I can't remember the exact number of miles I was away from the pole, but I think I want to say like 100, 150, something like that. I've never actually gone back to check. Like, like how many miles were you doing a day? Like how, what's an average mile? Oh per gosh. Day so we doing? do, we work in nautical miles in okay. Antarctica. I can't remember what that translates to. Uh, um, one was a 1.2 nautical miles uh, per, I honestly don't know. per mile. I but I was know. doing, say like my, one of my biggest days was 25 nautical miles. Oh wow! So probably thirty. And that, that, that was that was a that was a huge day. Um, wow. Most were not that because you just you can't. It, it sounds like you're just skiing on this flat. You're not. It's pretty bumpy, and um, you've got sometimes you've got huge ice structures to go around. Um, so it takes a while to cover any kind of distance. The yeah, one, about a hundred. One point one five zero eight. Oh, nautical, I thought it was more than that. Nautical mile. <laughs> Yeah, is one point one five zero eight miles that. or six thousand seventy six feet. So got it. Yeah. Um. So I'm fairly close to the to the end, and um, I started getting these little ulcers on my leg, my inner thigh. I, I knew all about them. They're called polar thigh. A lot of women get in that area. Men tend to get it on their stomach. Um, it tends to be wherever you carry more of your fat. And not a big deal. I had them the year before. They were tiny and um, just covered them up and they went away when I got home. This year, uh, that year rather, the second time, they were getting a bit bigger. And each time one opened up on my inner leg, I had something called granny flex and I had a piece of it kind of around this size. And each time an ulcer opened, I would just cut a piece of the granny flex. It's like super sticky adhesive um, bandage, like a band-aid. Um, normally used in like military zones, so it just it just covers up whatever the problem is, and it will not come off until you have like a you know a hot bath for a couple of hours. It's really hard to get off. Oh, Anytime man. one of them opened up, I would just slap a piece of the granuflex on, and make no mistake, I was in a huge amount of pain. But it was it was just about bearable. Um, and in terms of pain relief, I only have a very small bag of pain relief with me, and really that's reserved for the situation where I you know break a shoulder, fall in a crevasse, and someone has to come rescue me take the morphine until they get there. It's not, it's not for day to day. Right. 
Um, I'm definitely aware it's getting worse. I don't want the doctors to know on my evening compulsory call because I've been here before. You're not pulling me <laughs> and I'm so close. Um, but the pain is getting worse and worse very, very quickly. And one day I'm skiing in a complete whiteout. Like I cannot see a, a thing and I have a really benign fall. I just tripped. I don't know what on fall hit back and I hear and feel as my leg splits open. Mm. Wow. And all the, all the, the ulcers that I, underneath the grandiflex, I actually thought they were healing. Genuinely thought they were healing. Um, I thought I could see scab. I thought I could see healing. No, it was open and it became a big open wound. Oh my huge, gosh. Huge wound. Um, anyone who wants to see it, there's a photo of it on my Instagram. Um, it's got a big graphic warning up there because it's pretty rough. And what, what is your Instagram? Oh, it's at jenny.wordsworth. Like the Jenny poet. Dot words, words. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll put that in the bio or you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Maybe so people warn people not one. to don't look at that when you're eating or anything. Yeah, It'll really be off. It is. They, they're big <laughs> They're 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 adults, they can handle it, right? Yeah. And I I'm obviously still carrying on. Um I at this point I'm dragging my leg when I'm skiing. And trying to put my tent up in these storms, those really bad storms after that, it was so impossible because any movement of um, the leg would brush against my clothing and was just indescribable agony. I, I ran out of pain relief. And then the other problem was I, I didn't want to take too much pain relief because I need to be with it while I'm skiing right. for all the reasons I explained about being solo. So I can't take loads of morphine and just keep skiing. Like you, I don't know where to navigate to. That's exactly. <laughs> Um, I, I was definitely in a very bad way um, and I think I blocked a lot of it out but I I got to the South Pole and I arrived there there is a huge um, scientific base that belongs to the US and you're not allowed to go in there and I remember being read the riot act before I left um, as part of my briefing to be like, if you go in there, you basically cause a diplomatic incident. And I was, I just remember being terrified of accidentally going in there because it's not very obvious. So I mean, there is a place there at the South Pole. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, hey, they wave out the window at you and say, nice seeing you. And they keep on going. Or is there, is it manned or unmanned? So the, there's a, um, an American scientific base that is definitely manned. There's people okay. with their full, full time, full time. They don't really come outside. They tend to stay indoors. You're not allowed to go okay. anywhere near that, even though it's right in front of you. Okay. Um, but there is also for tourist activities, if you like, which I was classed as doing. Okay. Like there's people that fly in, just they fly under the South Pole. They take pictures at the, at the, the Barber's Pole, you know, the globe, and they leave again. So there's people doing that. And um, they will stay at the, the little campsite that I was allowed to go to. Very small, like tiny. I want to say maybe five or six tents when I was there. I think I arrived at three in the morning. Um, I knocked on the door. I didn't know, I didn't know how this works. I've never done this before. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, Dev, who one of the guys who works for the, the company, um, who set up the tents and look after the place. He's like, yeah, oh my God. And I, had, I saw him at the beginning, but that was a long time ago now. And um, yeah, I just took my bag off, sat down and he gave me a beer and we sat there for hours. And, but when I walked in, um, him and the, the other guy worked there, after about the first beer, they're like, Jen, like we, your leg, it, it really smells. Oh, wow. Um, now I couldn't smell a thing. And they were, you know, they're, they're, they're buddies. They were like, no, it's kind of bad. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, really bad. And I then found out later that um, she, like the entire middle bit of my leg had gone necrotic. It was black. Oh. It was it was dead. Oh my gosh! And they couldn't believe that I had skied through that. And but to me, there was I really did not think there was anything that wrong with my leg. I thought when we take this granny flex off, we're going to find this big scab is already healed. I'm a great healer. Blah blah blah. You know, full of it. I did not think I had a serious injury on my hands whatsoever. The next morning, uh, a doctor arrives at the South Pole. They're not, they're not normally there. Okay. Um, they only come if they have to. And actually, someone else, not too far away, had dislocated their hip. And so he happened to be in the area. And he's like, look, I want to come see this leg. They take me to a tent. They take, uh, they take it off. And it, the shock and disgust on their faces was really weird to me. I remember thinking, I don't understand what the problem is. 
And they're like, you really cannot smell that? And I remember I put my nose right in my leg. I was like, I can't smell anything. I'm like, I'm not lying. I really can't smell anything. I later find out when I was back in the UK in hospital, they brought in a, a sports psychologist to come see me. So I was having weird like flashbacks and all sorts. And I told her all this and she said to me, that is your brain saying you are reaching the South Pole no matter what. To the really? point that, that it switched off your ability to smell rotten flesh. Oh my gosh. Man, the body is amazing. Isn't it? Like, yes, the, that's I mean, crazy. I just got goosebumps now saying that. So the, your mind is saying, we've been through hell to get to the South Pole. We did it last year. We're doing it again this year. Like your whole life's been put on hold. The training, the, the, the body does to your family. Like, you know, everyone's got to support this. You are getting to the goddamn side pole. And um, yeah, a lot of people were like, you must be able to smell that hand on heart. I couldn't smell a thing. I really thought it was getting better. From there, we had to wait about three days at the South Pole until it was safe to fly back to the main base camp, which is about a three or four hour flight away, basically back to where I started. And the doctor was there. And the whole time they kept me um, high. I was told by the doctor, you take morphine every like two to three hours and you drink beer. And that is all you do. And I think, I now know from the doctor, they were trying to keep me from realizing just how bad the leg injury was. And also just keep me pain-free, comfortable. Um, and we flew back to the South Pole, uh, sorry, to the main base camp three or four days later. And that is where there's the showers and the little shower block. And that's the first opportunity they had to really clean it out, take a proper look, take the granny flex off. At that point, the doctor said to me, this is going to be one of the most painful things you've ever had to do. Oof. He handed me more morphine and a special kind of um, opioid you put under the tongue. I can't remember the name of it. And he gave me a bottle of whiskey. Oh my gosh. And he's like, take that whiskey into the shower. So I'm standing in the shower and we have to put like hot water all over the leg to get the granny flex kind of wet enough to slowly be able to peel it off. Oh, and I have to wait a long time. And there was a lady outside helping me get undressed and things. And she said I sounded like, you know, an animal being slaughtered, like the noises that were coming out of me. I got the granuflex off and I could not look at my leg. I could not look. I saw the edge of it and that was enough. I just didn't want to, I wasn't ready to look at it. Um, they then had to get me from the shower block to a little area where they can kind of put bandages on you in, in another little uh, tent. Um, so they had to put a, a bed mattress on the back of a skiddy and drag me over to the, to the main medical tent. And that's where they, they bandaged me up best they could. They put a lot of padding, so I'd always be comfortable on the flight home. Gave me more whiskey, more morphine, whatever I wanted. Um, oh. And then I had to wait. I think I think I flew out the next day um, on the big uh, jet back to Chile and then Chile back to London. Landed in London, and at this point, I had to admit I needed a wheelchair, couldn't walk. And my husband met me at the airport. I haven't seen him in a couple months. I'm really excited to go home to see my dog. Um, my husband is a, is a reconstructive plastic surgeon. And he's like, Jen, we're not going home. Like the theater staff are waiting for you at the hospital. It's all set up, ready to go. And they'd all be liaising with the team in Antarctica, ready to, to fix this leg. And even then I, I called him a drama queen. I was like, there's nothing wrong with my leg. I'm like, it's just, <laughs> it's going to scab over and I'm going to be fine. And he, I remember the look he gave me that was like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, we get to the hospital and I know like, normally Matt, my husband would be the guy that does this surgery but he's not going to operate on his wife. So his, his, his friend did the operation. Uh, I know the whole team. So it was really weird. I was like, guys, I, you know, I, I'm okay. Uh, and they're like, you're really not okay. So the first operation was to go in and clean it out, get the dead tissue out, take a look, see how bad the damage was. Um, and then the second operation was uh, a whole bunch of skin grafts to kind of make, make the leg um, look, look a bit better, I guess. The, where I was really lucky is there was no damage to any muscle. Um, it was all just, just soft tissue and, um, yeah, it was, it was quite a long recovery from it, but I know it sounds funny, but I almost tend to forget that it happened. Um, which is so different now. Cause when I was in hospital, I mentioned that sports psychologist came, I was getting, I, I want to be careful in saying PTSD, but that's, that's what they said it was, but it was very short term. It lasted about six weeks, but I was in the hospital and the whole room would suddenly turn into the South pole. Really? But it's, it's this huge, horrible storm. And someone would come out of nowhere and be like, so sorry, you, you can't come to the South Pole. But I could see it like just behind them. 
Um, or they'd be like, I'm so sorry, you've gone the wrong way. You have to go back. Or I'm so sorry, uh, the South Pole's closed today. You can't come in. Like every time it was someone blocking me from getting there. Um, and again, the psychologist said that was my brain trying to, I hadn't yet caught up with the fact that I'd done it. Like you made it, you're good. I was still kind of processing. And do then the other is right. Sorry, do you ever no. still have that? No, no, no. Okay. It was it was so short term, but I think I really thanked the doctor that operated on me because he could see that I needed to see a psychologist, and they brought her in the next day. And I think if I hadn't seen her immediately, I only saw her like three times after that. I, I probably would have lasted a lot longer. But she massively helped me. Um, she told me to read this book called The Body Keeps the Score. Um, it's a great book about like kind of they call it trauma, but like I guess any kind of physical um, exertion like that, and that you need to um, deal with it after you've gone through it and um, the other thing that was a big problem for me afterwards was getting into a shower when i stepped into a shower for the first time that immediately brought me back to being in antarctica um in that shower with a bottle of whiskey <laughs> um so it was a bit wild but i i have absolutely no regrets um, a lot of people when they see the leg now they're kind of a bit shocked um i think the scar that's left looks like the outline of antarctica on a map um i think it's kind of cool and that's it just cool. doesn't yeah, scars don't bother me. I'm looking forward to telling my grandchildren um, about that time that, that Granny skied solo to the South Pole. It's just well, I, I was going to say, <laughs> I know I've seen a picture of that scar somewhere on one of your um, something, but I cannot find it. I'm on your Instagram, and I just cannot. I can't. Um, it's, on, it's on like a, um, it's a second photo of one of the posts, so I didn't put it as a first photo because ah, it's, gotcha. it's a bit graphic. Yeah, yeah. Let me see. I'll have um, to. I'll have to find it because we could. Yeah. I could really share it. And... Or just um, just Google my name with polar thigh next to it. I'm pretty sure that'll come up. It was in the press a lot in the UK when I got back. Maybe that's what I saw. Jeannie. So, Jenny, I know you had a baby. How how old is your baby now? She's nearly two. Okay, so yeah, has that affected uh, how you feel about training, or has it affected if you're thinking I want to do endurance stuff again? Yeah. So since I've had her, I've done one. Um, Gosh, four week mountaineering expedition in the pole, uh, summited Mount Lubuchi. That was fine. It wasn't a particularly dangerous expedition. I had a great time. Um, and then the second race I've done was a um, oh, 3,000, three and a half thousand kilometer mountain bike race in Kyrgyzstan. Um, did that with my husband. I had a, quite a serious bike crash in that race. And it, you definitely come home thinking, do I? need to be doing these things as right. often as I'm doing them. You know, there's a little girl at home who doesn't really want to lose her mum. Right. Um, and then a, and then a friend lost her life in the mountains in Nepal. Ah, oh, gosh. And end of last summer, I think that was. And that really hit home because I don't know anyone more experienced than her in the mountains. Um, and I, you know, completely love mountaineering, but it definitely made me question, why do I do these things? And I came to realize it's actually just the love of the outdoors. So I know it sounds quite extreme, but like I love nothing more than, you know, getting up on summit day, it's 2 a.m. and you're climbing up towards the summit and the moon's out, the stars are out and you see the sun rising. It's things like that that I love. And you can still get that from doing much safer expeditions. Right. It doesn't have to be a world first. It doesn't have to be a mountain that no one's ever summited. I still like I had to just think, what do I get out of this? What do I love? And I realized that that's what it is. Um, I also love like the storytelling when you come back from things like this. Like I, um, when I got back from Antarctica, I did like a big school tour in the UK. I did some schools in the US as well. Like just telling children about these things and right. and showing them what's possible. That those are the kind of things that I get out of this. And um, so I, I will do other expeditions. They won't be as long with a child now, and I'd love to have more children. Um, and they'll they'll be, I guess, subjectively just a little bit safer, maybe. <laughs> So I have Googled uh, Jenny Davis polar thigh. I have found an article. Is it okay? Or is it not? Is it going to give you PTSD or anything like no, that? It's fine. All right. So I'm going to add yeah. this. I'm just throwing it out there. If you're watching on YouTube and you don't want to see it, just <laughs> go ahead and um, look away. So this. The top, the top one is the granny flex. Right. So, so you just kept throwing this on constantly yeah, thinking. Yeah. I'm healing really, really good, and I'm just going to yeah. keep going. It was very painful, but yeah, I thought it was healing. Yeah. Right. So afterwards, so how is this, 
I would assume this is not just after pulling it off. This has got to be is, some sort of. No, that's just after pulling it off. So that is all is. raw tissue and then the bit in the middle is dead. The black that's, stuff. that's the black in the middle is dead. And that's yeah. what you had to go through. Mm -hmm. Ugh, I'm. It's crazy. Uh, that is absolutely crazy. Yeah, that's my So Jenny, let me five. ask you, I mean, you do these endurance races, you do mountaineering, you do the desert races, you did the Antarctic skiing. So at some place you had to form some type of baseline fitness for you mm. to start to go from, you know, are you a, a CrossFit girl? Are you a, you know, you just do a lot of different things or wh what does that look like for you? Uh, I'm definitely a CrossFit girl. Um, I love CrossFit. Um, okay. But the, the, the different training every day is different. You don't know what's coming your way. When I was preparing for something specific like this, I had to, to, especially for Antarctica, I did have to get, I had two coaches and training was kind of very different. It was, it was a lot of it that was focused on weightlifting. Um, and like I said before, just bulletproofing every element of the body, a lot of sled dragging, um, a lot of um, getting two huge tractor tires, roping them together, um, harness, and then just going for 20 miles out in the English countryside. Um, I'd do that on my weekends because I couldn't get time off work to train for any of this. Go through the night, take the dog with me. My dog got, and my dog, anytime he saw those tires, he would run away from me. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, not again, not doing that again. And it, it, it sounds like a lot to fit in. And some people be like, that's a lot to sacrifice. And you're like, well, no, because it's what I wanted to do. If you don't want to do these things, if you're, if you're wise and good enough, you'll give up, a, you know, after one week. Yeah. Um, Did you compete yeah. in any of the CrossFit games? No, I've never gone that far into CrossFit because there's so much else I have to do to get ready for these things. So it's not right. a full-time CrossFit thing. And my background, so I used to swim for Scotland. My background was always swimming. Then I did a lot of triathlon. So I guess my base fitness was pretty good, um, especially with all the running. Um, but I, I mean, I love training. I love having a goal. I train every day of the week. Um, next, I'm hoping to do um, RAM next summer. So the bike race across America. Oh, really? Yeah, I think that'd be a lot of fun um, with three other women. Um, and then I'm also absolutely keen to row an ocean. So I should probably catch up with the last guest that you had. Yeah, um, I, I, actually... I can hook you up with him. He's a yeah. good dude. He's a great <laughs> I signed guy. Up, I signed up to, do, um, to row the Pacific and a team of four women. And um, it's quite a big process to go through that to get selected for the team. There's all this psychological testing, everything. I did all of that about two days worth. I signed the contract and the next morning got a positive pregnancy test. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, you know, well, you know, it seems like a reasonable trade off though. Right. Yeah, you exactly. know, so, one door's yeah. closed and other doors opened. Right. Yeah. And so they were the first people apart from my husband that actually found out I was pregnant. Cause I wanted to tell them the truth. Cause it would be really strange to suddenly pull out after all that work. Right. Um, but yeah, there's, I, I just love, I love the, the physical test of endurance and seeing what you're actually capable of. And well, I think what I learned from Antarctica is uh, with someone like me, I probably got to be careful because I've always known I could push through hard things. I did not know I could push through a rotting leg, Right. you know, that's yeah, not, a lot of people pass me on the back about it, but actually, actually, let's just take a step back. Is that really good for you? Um, sure, like that mental resilience is to be applauded, but you can take it too far, which is what that that book goes into. Like the body keeps the score, um, and I came back a little bit, a little bit spooked by it. Like I, wow, like how did I do that? It took a while to process, but um, I guess I still don't really know where my limits are, um, and maybe I don't need to. <laughs> right? Maybe we don't need to find that limit. <laughs> yeah, maybe we're good. Maybe we're good. Right. So was that the hardest thing, the Antarctica thing, or was there something else that was a bigger challenge that you did? Um, harder for different reasons. I did a, a six day race across a, um, a desert in Iran. And looking back now, I'm not sure it was wise to go to Iran at all. Uh, no, probably um, not. Probably not. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't go now. Things are a little bit different, but it was it was the hottest environment I have ever been in. Um, so on the fourth day of the race, I was in the lead and it was 66 degrees Celsius was the recorded temperature, which I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. I don't. Is, well, I'll figure it out. Yeah, Brad's, uh, anytime you see him looking up, he's Googling something. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's obscenely hot. And actually, the race was not a safe one. It should have been pulled. They kept moving the, where the water 
supply oh. was going to be. So, so let's take a guess, Russ. What do you think the temperature was? I was going to say it was. It's one hundred and five degrees. One hundred and fifty. One hundred and fifty. Yeah. Sixty-six yeah. degrees Celsius is one hundred and fifty point eight degrees Fahrenheit. That's crazy. I mean, that's like melting your tennis shoes if you're on pavement type thing. It was absolutely awful, and it's because we dropped down into a bowl in the desert. I had to camp there overnight. And um, people were passing out. People were being given IVs. It was not a safe race. And actually, after the race, like I won that race, and the race director was like, "Will you promote this when you get back to the UK?" And I was like, "Absolutely not! <laughs> like this is this is the worst event." And we were all, you know, a couple of us were there as like paid at. Like they wanted us to come out and promote the race, and they now do it at a different time of year, so it's a bit cooler. But they had they had um they had to bring in a truck, and you know, in the middle of nowhere, I don't know where they got it from, and they had to start handing out huge lumps of ice. And you had to put them under your hat on your chest. It was, you know, that feeling when you open the oven door and you get yeah. that, like, it was being in that permanently. Um, it you was probably get flashbacks safe. when you're cooking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the, the other reason that race was so difficult is we were there also on behalf of an NGO to try and encourage the government to allow women to take part in sports. Um, and they, they just before we arrived said that women could take part in the race. We managed to find one Iranian woman who was up for doing it. She was incredible. But we had to stay covered the entire time. That's nuts. And that was, um, I guess, you know, the Iranian lady is more used to it. But for us, I mean, that was just hell on earth. I'm already dying in this heat. And now you want me to cover up. Um, and they were checking, you know, uh, along the way. And in the more remote bits, I would definitely, I took took the cover off and got my arms and legs out. There's no one there. I mean, literally in the desert. Um, but if we got anywhere near a town on certain days, you had to cover up. And I find that, I find that really difficult. Um, the government were also watching our every move while we were there. And I think it was just youth. I just thought, no one's going to arrest me. For but I think if I went now, you know, you'd become a political pawn. I, I, I was going to say, if North Korea calls, just don't take the call. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the next, um, I got back from that and I was invited to this race in Afghanistan. And at that point, I'd met my now husband and he's on a tour in Afghanistan. And he was like, I will never tell you not to do something, but this is me telling you. <laughs> don't do something. <laughs> don't, don't do this. Yeah. <laughs> so we're getting down. Our hour went really, really fast. Um, so we're going to get down to the crux of the situation. You ran across the United States or were you running across the United States? I was part of a team with other people, yes. Yeah. So okay. There's a lady who was trying to break the world record, and we were all there supporting her, doing right. it with her. Yeah. So you're in New Mexico. Yes. <laughs> and you really want to run, and you have to run across an Indian reservation. Yeah. You meet with a chief, mm -hmm. and the chief says, let me tell you about the time I met Bigfoot. Yep, he did. He, so he... It was like 10.30 in the morning. <laughs> He pours a huge whiskey, not like a little whiskey. I mean, I love whiskey. I'm a big, you know, from Scotland, I'm a big whiskey drinker. Not at 10.30 in the morning. Yeah. I'm in my running gear. And we have a camera crew with us because the whole thing was being made into a, a documentary series. And everyone's waiting outside. I literally just came into the government building to get sign-off to run through the Indian reservation. Um, but it was a huge deal. They wanted to interview us. They wanted us to come sit down. And then eventually it was me and him and his lovely office he opened up the balcony doors. Here's your whiskey. Come, come sit with me. It's like, oh, okay, absolutely. I would love to. Thank you so much for this opportunity. <laughs> yeah, right. I got the whole story about the time he saw so Bigfoot, um, seen him on several occasions, and yeah, the whole thing was absolutely fascinating. So that is the reason I do believe that you joined us this evening, is because yes. we had a, a mutual friend, and they're like, hey. I got a buddy that does Bigfoot and why don't you talk to him? And I said, would she, you know, absolutely. Would she come on the show? And he said, I will ask her and you are gracious enough to do so. And, um, I'm not going to say this, but it's rumored that we got someone that Joe Rogan could not get. So <laughs> I'm just going to throw it out yeah, there. Just Russ, throwing it out there. Just Russ is laughing just, at just... me, but I'm taking anything I can get at this point in time. So, <laughs> No, no comment. And so we owe you a Bigfoot trip. <laughs> we owe you a Bigfoot trip. Oh, yes, I absolutely. mean, I, before I, you I, leave I next year. Yeah. yeah, you've got until uh, November. Okay. No. Well, is there a have... season? Is there a season no. for it? No. No. Cool. No. Jenny, I have a question before we let you go. I mean, you're so accomplished. I mean, you're a lawyer. You've been successful doing that. You've done all these races and done these things that no one else around the world has done and certainly piled together. I'm sure it's the resume is 
you know, shocking, but do you have a word of advice that you would give to people things that something that you look back and you think there's just this one thing, what would you tell people? I would tell people whether you think you can, you look at something that I've done and you think, Oh my God, I can never do that. First of all, you're wrong. And second of all, even if it's, it's not, you have no interest in skiing to the South pole, that's fine, but you will be applying that limited limiting mindset to something else in your life. I guarantee it. So if you look at what I've done, you think I couldn't do that. There'll be something in your life. You're taking that same attitude with. So absolutely just ditch it. Um, and I was thinking, whatever you're doing, just figure out your why. Why are you doing it? And that tends to unlock everything. Um, that's what I found anyway. Thank you so much for your time. Yes. Thank you. We appreciate it greatly. Thank you. What a remarkable well, woman. Absolutely. And I'm so glad she came on the show. Like I said, our hour went so quick. Um, it was very uh entertaining and she has done things that's 99.9999% of the people will never do. Yeah. And that's, that's absolutely amazing. So, yeah. Um, we could reach her. She's her, her, uh, Instagram was Jenny dot, dot Wadsworth Wadsworth. Yep. Uh, you can Google Jenny Davis and her website will come up. Um, and we will, I'll go ahead and find that and put it in our show notes when we, uh, uh, finish this off. So please like, please subscribe. We appreciate you following us. Yep. Bigfootdoc.com. If you want to reach out, tell us something, have a comment, have a question for us. We're going to do a episode here pretty soon of question and answers that we've been getting from some people. Yep. Other than that, Russ is the star. And uh, follow him on Instagram at Wide Open Research. And, yes, uh, we're good. The TikTok. Network. TikTok. He's on TikTok. I don't like the Wide Open Research. Yep, he's got that phone in his Faraday cage running the TikTok right. app. So that's right. All it's right. Good to see you, my friend. We out of here, man. <laughs>